So uh, self-organized formation of topologically robust grid cell modules. I'm curious to see what that means. And yeah, go ahead, Safter. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, as I said, so I'm going to be talking about some things that are quite different uh, from what I had spoke about um, a few days ago. So a few days ago, I talked about reservoir computing, which is largely talking about, I guess, data science and dynamics. And we looked at a problem inspired from neuroscience. Over here, instead, I'm going to look very much at a systems neuroscience problem, and I'll work using dynamics modeling, and I'll then make some connections to the data. Um, and I know there's a lot of jargon in my title right now, but hopefully it'll all make sense. Uh, broadly speaking, I'm going to be talking about uh, grid cells, which are a part of the circuit of the brain that are very, very essential in spatial navigation. Basically, how do you keep track of where you're moving? How do you move around? How do you know where you are? Uh, basically the circuitry involved with things like that. Um, just shout out to the people I've done this work with. Uh, I've done this largely with a graduate student, Mikhail Kona, and uh, of course, Professor Ilafit, whose lab, whose lab I'm a postdoc in right now. And this is all work I've done at the Brain and Cog Side Department at MIT. So uh, let's just get right into it. Um, oh yeah, I guess I should also say that uh, what I'll be talking about today is basically is out in a preprint right now. It's all you can basically find it in this. And I'll, I'll give a slide, I'll put up this link at on my last slide as well. Okay, so um, a few days ago, I think day before yesterday, we heard this nice talk by uh, Vizita, who had talked about uh, some interesting things about how the hippocampus is important um, in uh, the studies that she was doing. And what I'll be looking at is a part of the brain that is quite close to the hippocampus, uh, which is the medial entorhinal cortex. And in particular, I'll be looking at these grid cells. So, so what are grid cells, right? So grid cells are these very, very interesting new set neurons in the brain that keep track of location modulo a hexagonal lattice. So, so what do I mean by that, right? So over here, there's this uh, experiment by Dodekna and others. So this box is basically roughly one meter by one meter. And over here, there's a rat that's just moving around in this box. And you can see there's basically this wire that's sticking into the rat's head. And whenever that neuron spikes, there's a white dot that's placed on the screen over here. So as the rat moves around, we just place various dots in this box. And as you might be able to see, there's this remarkable thing that emerges, which is that the pattern of these dots that emerge is really forming a hexagonal pattern. So there's basically a hexagonal spatial tuning curve of these neurons. Right? And so just another schematic of that, you're basically measuring one neuron. Let's say you're measuring this blue neuron over here. And the gray line, which I guess is a bit faint, is just the rat's path. And the blue dot is whatever the spatial location of the rat was whenever the neuron spiked. And you get this hexagonal pattern, which itself was quite surprising. Uh, eventually, work around all this led to a Nobel Prize as well. Um, but yeah, so this is a very, very interesting uh, circuitry. And if you look, okay, and I should say that this neuron is a grid cell. Right? That's what a grid cell is in all of this. And so now if I look at another nearby neuron, say this orange neuron over here, it also keeps track of spatial location. It also has a hexagonal firing field, but the hexagon is now slightly shifted. It has a slightly different phase. And if I look at yet another grid cell, it will also have a hexagonal firing field, which will have yet another phase as well. So in this sense, as you look at different grid cells, they all have different phases, but they're all these hexagonal grids and I, hence the name grid cell, right? Um, but also, of course, if you look at even further away grid cells, they also have different lattice spacings. So over here are basically heat maps of these same uh, scatter plots that I've shown over here. And this is one grid cell, this is the next grid cell, and this is a third grid cell. And you can see that you have different spatial scales as well uh, that are present for these grid cells, right? So you have these grid cells, you have multiple grid cells for the same phase, for different phases for one lattice spacing, and then you also have multiple lattice spacings, right? Okay. Uh, what's also interesting is that in the biology of the system, uh, these are, you basically have these grid cells that are arranged in a particular way along uh, the dorsoventral axis of the medial entorhinal cortex, where basically at one end you have these larger grid periods, and at the other end you have much smaller grid periods. So it's this, it's this kind of regular arrangement as you go from one end to the other. Um, and so if we just try to examine that arrangement a little bit more. Um, so over here, what I basically have is a scatter plot where on the x axis I'm varying dorsoventral position. So basically spatial location along the dorsoventral axis of the medial entorhinal cortex. And on the y-axis, I'm plotting the grid period, 
right? So each dot over here is one grid cell. And what you'll notice right away is that these grid cells are not arranged just continuously varying from one end to the other, but rather they're, they're really in clusters. So for example, all of these grid cells have the same grid period, roughly 98.4 centimeters. All of these grid cells, for example, all again have roughly the same period of roughly 65 centimeters and so on and so forth. So basically the arrangement of grid cells in the medial entorhinal cortex is not in a continuous fashion, but in the form of discrete modules. And each module keeps track of one lattice spacing, but of course each grid cell within the same module has a different phase, right? So this is the spatial organization. But what's really interesting and remarkable is that if you go into the system and you actually measure biophysical properties, right? So let's say you measure the time constant of neurons, maybe you measure, say, the number of, say, axonic terminals, maybe you measure, say, the resistance of, this, of the membrane, you might measure the threshold of spiking and so on and so forth. There are lots of properties that you can measure. But what you'll notice is that for all of these, these properties vary continuously as you go from one end to the other, right? So they're all varying continuously. But the emergent behavior of these grid periods is really in terms of discrete modules, right? And so the central question that I'm going to try to address today is basically how do you get from continuous biophysical gradients to discrete functional modules, right? So that's the central question I'd like to answer today, right? And of course, I should say this is not a problem that only exists in grid cells, right? I mean, uh, like another common example of people that look at this question all the time is in the case of like uh, development in biology and like insect segmentation. So here, this is like Drosophila embryo. And you can see that some proteins basically is like bicoid proteins basically set up a gradient from one end to the other. And then through the developmental processes, you eventually get some sort of segmentation that arises in the fly, right? And so of course, it's, it's a fairly important question in biology, just this general idea of you have continuous gradients, which are easy to set up from biochemical processes. How do you go from there to discrete modules, right? And I'm not going to claim to give you like a super general answer to this today. I'm going to stick largely to the realm of grid cells. And I'll tell you how modularization occurs there, but hopefully I'll be able to convince you that the mechanism I'm going to propose is actually quite general. And we're kind of hopeful that it might actually apply to a lot of other places as well. Now. Um, I know this might have been a lot of biology to throw at you. So just to keep everyone interested, let me just give a quick preview of the results that I'm going to get to by the end of this talk, right? Uh, I'm going to present a grid cell modularization mechanism that we call peak selection. And what's going to be wonderful is that we're going to be able to match experimental data better than all previous models, right? And so just to give you a flavor of what I, what I mean by that is that so a quantity that people in this field are often interested in is the period ratio. So for example, um, I look at you, people look at the ratio of periods between grid modules, right? So because a single grid period is in mean, this 98.4 is in centimeters, it's a dimension full quantity, but you can take ratios and get a dimensionless number. And so if you just look at this ratio, 98.4 divided by 65.0, you get this 1.514. And similarly, you can calculate the next ratio, 65.0 divided by 48.4, and you get this 1.343, right? And so you get a bunch of period ratios. And so the, what people think of as the common knowledge in the field is that people think that this, the mean period ratio of grid cells is roughly 1.4. This is something that people uh, you know, claim uh, all the time, really. Um, what we're going to present and what I'm going to be able to show you by the end of the talk, hopefully today, is that the theory that we present will be able to give a detailed prediction of every period ratio not just an average period. And they're going to be some very nice, simple uh, ratios. So here you can see you just have some nice rationals, three over two, four over three, five over four. And you can see right away, just at a, at a quick glance that these numbers are just very, very close to the data, right? So in this sense, I will show you that the experiment, the results that we get from our model fit the experimental data better than all previous models. Moreover, in this process, we're also going to be able to make some predictions for future experiments. And we're going to do all of that in a robust fashion that does not require any fine tuning or optimization. This is not going to be like a biological system where I have like a hundred parameters and I need to tune all of them to actually fit my data. It's going to basically not require any fine tuning at all. And it's going to be almost parameter free. It will have a single parameter and that's it, right? And with all of that, I'm going to be able to fit this data very well, right? So hopefully that's keeping you all interested. Um, and so now let me just go to the outline of my talk. I'll talk about the continuous attractor model, which is the general setting, how people 
uh, think of grid cells today. I'll talk about how pattern formation occurs on continuous attractors. Um, and then from there, I talk about how, uh, what we are, call a fixed scale interaction, basically uh, gives rise to the requirements for peak selection. And from there, we'll get to some results and predictions. So let's get started by talking about what are continuous attractors, right? So continuous attractors are something that may not be familiar to everyone. Um, so in dynamical systems theory, people generally think of four types of attractors. You have fixed points, limit cycles, quasi-periodic orbits, and chaotic attractors, right? Continuous attractors are related, but kind of different. Um, what they basically are is that, okay, let's say I have some arbitrary uh, phase space, and I consider, say, this circle over here represents a fixed point. So what I'm going to have is I won't have one fixed point, but instead I'll have a series of fixed points such that the fixed points themselves form a continuum, right? So the set of fixed points forms some sort of continuum. This forms some sort of manifold, such that now any point in phase space is attracted towards this manifold, but points on the manifold are basically like quasi, uh, quasi stable to uh, motion along this manifold, right? And so in this sense, I just want to point out, this is not like a limit cycle. I mean, this continuous attractor, even if, if, if it were a ring, I'm not talking about points that go around the circle like that. It's that every point is in itself a fixed point, right? And so basically, I guess the intuition is that if regular fixed points are just like a ball in a U-shaped well, uh, a continuous attractor is just like a ball in like a box, right? So now this ball is stable at every single point. And I guess what's important to point out then is that if the ball is stable at every continuous valued position, then you can kind of store continuous valued, a continuous valued variable in this network. And that's really why they're important in the brain because the brain wants to keep track of continuous valued things and continuous attractors just seem like, you know, a useful uh, neural circuitry by which the brain does that, right? Okay, so why am I talking about continuous attractors? Well, it's because grid cells uh, have, I mean, people generally believe that they are really implemented in the brain through a continuous attractor model, right? So let me just explain how that happens. And uh, the way I'm going to do it is by just consider a simplified one dimensional abstraction of a grid cell. Okay, so what is that really going to be? So first let me consider a one dimensional neural sheet. So what I mean by neural sheet in this context, just that each of these circles is one neuron. And I'm just thinking of this, all these neurons are just arranged on a line, right? So it's what we call a one dimensional neural sheet. And on this neural sheet, I'll think of a spatially invariant kernel, right? So let me think of a sort of Mexican hat kind of kernel. It's spatially invariant. So what every neuron is doing is it's inhibiting neurons around it within some radius. And then it's al allowing neurons to remain active some distance away. So now if I give some sort of random initialization, where this initialization isn't the firing rates of these neurons, uh, basically whatever relatively high fluctuation you'll have, it will suppress things around it, it will allow things away from it. And essentially this is just a sort of Turing pattern formation and you just get a sort of periodic uh, pattern on this neural sheet, right? So it's essentially just Turing pattern formation over here. Um, but okay, this is right now all on the neural sheet. I've just shown you that you get a periodic pattern of activity on the neural sheet. But what I talked about in grid cells was really spatial tuning curves, right? So I talked about external space and I said that as the rat moved around, the neurons spiked in particular locations, right? So how do you get from this neural sheet to this external spatial tuning curves? Well, uh, basically Burak and Feet had basically shown in 2009 through some very nice arguments um, that basically you can couple the rat's motion with the motion of the pattern on the neural sheet itself and that is sufficient to give you external spatial tuning curves. So basically what do I mean by that? So let's just consider a particular neuron. Let's say I'm measuring, I have I've sent an electrode in and I'm measuring this particular neuron over here, right? So you can see right now this neuron is not firing because well, my activity is zero over here and you can see correspondingly the rat does, there's no firing at this location for the rat. Now, as the rat moves around, basically you can couple the rat's motion to motion of the pattern on the neural sheet. So now you can imagine that as the rat continues to move ahead, eventually this activity will increase at the neuron you're measuring, and that will correspond to the neuron spiking in that spatial location. So in this sense, you, if you can couple the two things together, basically you can get a mapping from the periodic pattern on the neural sheet to the spatial tuning curves in external space, right? And I won't spend too much time talking about how you do this coupling. Uh, it's not, uh, I'll just take a lot of time to explain all of that. But I just want to say that this really is what happens in the biology, right? I mean, you can experimentally look at the activity on 
uh, the medial entorhinal cortex uh, was done by these people in 2018. And you can see some kind of hexagonal uh, firing pattern. And that really corresponds to these two dimensional hexagonal spatial tuning curves uh, that I had shown you uh, in my first couple of slides, right? So in this sense, really, this is really what's actually going on in the system. Um, but what we're going to do is we're just going to think of the one dimensional picture just because, well, it's going to be easy for me to draw, right? So let's just look at the one dimensional picture. And we're also going to assume that this coupling um, can be done. So our focus will just be on the pattern formation aspects on the neural sheet. So if we can get the periodic pattern on the neural sheet, we'll assume that you can indeed go to the spatial tuning curves and eventually show evidence for that towards the end of my talk. But for now, let's just understand the pattern formation aspect. How do you actually get these patterns forming on the neural sheet? Just with a little bit of math, right? So uh, what's going to be essential, the essential quantity, it's going to be the Fourier transform of the interaction kernel, right? So if W was my interaction kernel, just that Mexican hat looking like thing, uh, what you basically do is you look at the Fourier transform of that interaction kernel, where W tilde of K, where K of course is just uh, the wave number, two pi over lambda. And okay, so what is W tilde really, right? It's just the magnitude of various periodic components in the Fourier transform. So as you can imagine, if K star is the wave number of the actual formed pattern, it will just correspond to wherever the Fourier transform is maximized. The strongest periodic component of W will dictate the, the periodicity of the form pattern. So basically K star is just given by the value of K that maximizes W tilde. And then you can basically just use this equation to find out what lambda star is, which is just uh, the actual periodicity, once again, in terms of the value of K that maximizes the Fourier transform of the interaction kernel. Right, and that lambda star is basically going to be this lambda star over here. That is basically the distance between these bumps, right? Okay, and so, I mean, just, sorry, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so basically the prescription is the following. You have an interaction kernel that looks like this. You take its Fourier transform. You see where it's maximized. That is K star. You invert that to get lambda star. And that is the periodicity of the form pattern, right? Um, so it's essentially just some simple, uh, we can derive this fairly straightforwardly, essentially all just during pattern formation over here. Um, and this is going to be an important enough equation that I'd just like to box it. I, I don't want you all to forget this so soon. Uh, I just want uh, to highlight this a little bit right now, right? So this is how, this basically dictates the math behind what kind of pattern do you form on this neural sheet. And this basically gives us a set of, of activity bumps that are equally spaced and so all of these grid cells are really part of the same module. They are all really corresponding to the same periodicity because well, the periodicity is just the gap, the spacing between these bumps, right? Okay, so we, we, we understand all of this. Let's now get back to the biology of the system, right? So one thing that I had pointed out is that the biology of the system has all sorts of biophysical gradients as you go from one end to the other, right? Okay, so how might you add that into the system? The most straightforward way you might add it is by saying that, okay, now my interaction kernel, instead of being completely spatially invariant, I'm just gonna think of it as a Mexican hat, but now my Mexican hat is just going to vary in scale as I go from one end to the other, right? So just a simple way of thinking of what continuous gradients might be manifested as, right? And so I'm basically gonna represent that with this kind of schematic over here. Sigma of X is the scale of this Mexican hat. As I go from one end to the other, sigma of X basically just reduces continuously. Okay, so now if I again uh, initialize this with some kind of initial condition, I then now let this evolve according to these interaction kernels and I see what I get, you get something that looks like this. So what, what's going on over here? So the first plot is basically the firing rate of these neurons as a function of spatial position. And once again, you get these activity bumps, similar to the activity bumps I was showing you on the previous slide. But now because of this gradient, you can see that the gap between these activity bumps is basically just decreasing continuously. And that's really what's then the second plot over here. I'm just explicitly looking at what the gap is between these activity bumps. And you can see it just decreases in this continuous fashion. And I mean, okay, this is probably not so, this so surprising at all, right? I mean, if I introduce a continuous gradient in my system, you probably expect properties to vary in a continuous fashion, right? But as I had pointed out, this is not what you actually see in the biology of the system. Something happens by which instead of having a continuously varying period, you have the emergence of discrete modules, right? So, so what is that secret sauce? How do you get discrete modules arising in the system? So it turns out that the secret ingredient is the addition of another fixed scale interaction, a secondary fixed scale interaction. So what do I mean by that, right? So what I'm going to do in addition to considering this Mexican hat 
I'm going to just add another fixed scale interaction term. So over here, at every point in space, I'm adding some interaction, uh, some inhibitory interaction, which exists at some scale d. And d I'm going to just assume is constant everywhere. So this bar over here of d does not vary in space, it's just constant everywhere in space. And it turns out, well, if you just do this, uh, the system just spontaneously modularizes. You just have the emergence of spontaneous discrete modules. So once again, in this firing rate plot, you can see that I have periodic activity bumps, but clearly in this entire region, the activity bumps all have the same spacing. And then in this next region, they all have another fixed spacing and so on and so forth. And you can see that in the second plot as well, you have a constant period and then you have a discrete change and then another constant period and so on. And really this is just quite similar to what uh, the grid cell modules look like, right? Because now I can take a histogram of all of these grid periods and you get something that looks like this, which is already looking remarkably similar to the histogram of uh, periods that were experimentally measured back in 2012, right? Um, okay, but you might say, hold on a second. I mean, I've added this scale D. I've, it seems like I'm introducing some non-local interactions. Maybe the scale D is just deciding where these modules are, right? I mean, that's not so special then. Well, it turns out that that's not quite the case, right? So over here, this bar over here is two scale of what D is. And you can see D is much smaller than the scale of these modules. So in that sense, indeed, all of these interactions are just local interactions. So just from local interactions and from continuous gradients, somehow we have this macroscopic emergence of macroscopic modules, which are at much larger scales, right? And so that's really something quite remarkable. And uh, yeah, of course, we want to understand this a little bit more. So why exactly would just doing something as simple as this give rise to discreteness just from continuous gradients, right? So, well, it all goes back to that equation that I asked you to remember from a few slides ago, which is basically that the periodicity of the formed pattern is given by the K value that maximizes the Fourier transform, right? And so that's just the same equation over here where you notice I've introduced some X dependencies over here because now I'm saying that, hey, my interaction is not spatially invariant. I have some X dependency of my interaction kernel. So all this equation is now saying that locally the period of the formed pattern is given by the maxima of the Fourier transform of the local interaction kernel, right? It's essentially the same idea as uh, how I described it earlier on ahead, right? Um, okay, so given that, what can we do, right? So this is the first Mexican hat term, right? And you can see this is just a little animation just showing it's stretching out. This is just the animation is just going from one end of the middle and terminal cortex to the other. You can see it just stretches itself out. The second term that we added was this fixed scale interaction, which over here I had just I just showed with uh, it exists at some length scale d, and I've just shown it with some inhibitory interaction that is just localized at the scale d, right? Now, if you look at the Fourier transforms of these functions, uh, the Fourier transform of this Mexican hat-like function is this other Mexican hat-like function. As this Mexican hat varies continuously, so does this. The second term over here, the fixed scale interaction, well, as you might be able to think of from properties of Fourier transforms, basically the Fourier transform of this function is going to be an oscillatory function. So in particular, if this is D, then this function over here is just going to be something like cosine KD multiplied by some broad Gaussian envelope, right? But all that's essential over here is that the Fourier transform of a function that looks like this indeed has multiple maxima and minima. So now when I look at the net interaction, the overall kernel, which you can see in real space just varies continuously and has nothing funny and discrete going on about it, the maxima of that Fourier transform is just going to look at like a Mexican hat with this additional wiggliness on top of it. And so the maxima, which I represent with this black dot, will have to hop discreetly from one maxima to the next. Right? It has to jump from one point to the next. And so the maxima is going to have to vary discreetly. And really, as you might now be able to predict just from this equation, if this maxima is going to vary discreetly, I have interesting things going to start to happen, right? So let's just uh, zoom into just that portion over here. Uh, what's basically happening is that the secondary fixed scale interaction that I added, it's set up a set of a fixed set of possible local maxima. And then this gradient term, which was coming from the biophysical gradients of my system, is just selecting which of those peaks to convert from a local maxima to a global maxima. That's all that's happening over here, right? And if the maxima of W tilde changes abruptly, 
That means, of course, k star changes abruptly because that is what this uh, pattern forming equation told us. If k star changes abruptly, that means the periodicity changes abruptly because, of course, the periodicity is just 2 pi over k star. And well, that's just grid cell modules, right? That's saying that as you go from one end to the other, the periodicity must vary discreetly. So you ha must have a constant period for some distance corresponding to just the position of a local maxima. And then it must discreetly vary to hop to another constant, right? And that's really just what these grid cell modules are, right? what, what people describe them as in the experiments themselves. Okay, so it's a fairly simple set of ideas, right? Uh, what can you actually get out of all of this, right? Where does all of this theory actually take us? So, well, if you just work on the details of the analysis that I've presented, you can obtain a simple equation for the grid period of the nth module. So basically this fixed scale interaction, it's an oscillatory function. And so it's maxima or the nth maxima is going to be some at, at integer points plus some phase shift, right? So just proportional to n plus phi over two pi. And then corresponding the period that's formed, the grid period is one upon, is proportional to one upon n plus phi over two pi. And you might ask me, hey, what's these proportionality constraints? But again, I can't tell you those because they're dimensionful quantities, but I can, but I can just take period ratios. So if I take period ratios of lambda n over lambda n plus one, or the period ratio between the nth grid cell module and the n plus one grid cell module, you get a very, very simple equation, n plus one plus phi over two pi divided by n plus phi over two pi. Right? It's a fairly simple looking equation. And uh, if you go back to the, those experimental results that I had shown, this is basically how I got these period ratios. This is just with phi equal to zero. And well, this fit is just remarkable, right? I mean, it's an R square of 0.999. I mean, I came um, into neuroscience from like a much more theoretical physics kind of background. And uh, this was like one of the first problems I worked on where I was actually going to be looking at things matching to data. And never in my life would I, have, would I have expected to be able to write out a purely theoretical explanation that fits the data so well. I mean, it's just really, really remarkable to me, right? But, and, and really this all just happened just by having to choose this value of phi to be zero, right? So this is really just like a single parameter fit. Or is it, right? I mean, you might say, hey, I mean, I made a lot of choices to get to here, right? Is it really one parameter? I chose a Mexican hat. I chose a fixed scale interaction that had a particular shape and form. And only then did I get this. Is this really a one parameter fit? Like, aren't there all the other parameters? Well, it turns out it is just a one parameter fit. Because Fourier transforms of simple functions have simple forms. Um, and that's a statement that I can quantify, but I'm not really going to for the purposes of the duration of this talk. I mean, the essential idea is that in the biology of a system, you're not really going to have a kernel that has some very intricate form, right? In a biological system, it's hard to encode something very intricate looking. If you have a relatively simple looking interaction kernel, you're going to have a relatively simple looking Fourier transform equation. And it boils down eventually to just having this very same equation. So, I mean, for example, I've been showing you this so far where I have this Mexican hat, which is varying in this gradient fashion and this fixed scale interaction that looks like this. And that gave us modules which correspond to this equation, but you can really vary this in a lot of ways. You can change the fixed scale interaction to be a decaying interaction. You can change it to be something that's diffuse and then just gets cut off. You can even change the Mexican hat. I mean, the Mexican hat doesn't have to be a Mexican hat. It can even just be a box. Right, and just uh, just try to point out that Kui and others did look at box-shaped kernels and grid cells, but they weren't looking at the modularization aspects. But really, I mean, you can just have a variety of kernel shapes. They will all give you grid cell modules, and they will all follow precisely the very same equation, just for different values of phi. So in that sense, this equation really just has this one parameter phi, right? And it's really invariant to a wide changes of kernel shapes, right? And so the only quantity that's changing across these different kernel shapes is a single parameter phi. And moreover, phi actually has some sort of relevance to the biology of the system, right? So from the single parameter phi, we might actually be able to make some predictions about what the actual connectomics are corresponding to the fixed scale interaction, what the actual connectivity of the neurons might be, right? Um, so for example, for phi equal to zero, uh, one can say that under certain approximations of simplicity of functions, uh, the fixed scale interaction will look like one of these forms or a linear combination of these forms, which is just like a decaying fixed scale interaction or a localized fixed scale interaction. And you might say, hey, maybe you did some experiments and you saw phi was close to pi over two, then that might predict that 
um, the, inter the fixed scale interaction is actually some sort of diffuse fixed scale interaction that extends up to a distance d, right? And so this phi quantity uh, that you can actually measure from fitting grid periods by looking at the rat moving around in the box might actually give you some predictions about the actual connectivity of the neurons in the medial entorhinal cortex, right? And maybe phi is equal to zero. Um, so phi is certainly very close to zero for the data set that I showed you. And we did go ahead and look at all the data sets we could find in the literature with multiple grid cell modules simultaneously measured. And it seemed that phi seemed to be close to zero for all of them. But I'm a bit wary of saying that with a lot of statistical certainty because there hasn't been a lot of data. Uh, NeuroPixel technology right now is allowing people to be able to measure multiple grid cell modules simultaneously. And so we're hopeful of having a lot more data uh, in the coming years. And maybe then we'll actually be able to narrow down this question of what phi is more precisely. And maybe that will then lead to some insight of the connectomics. And I should also say that there is possibly some kind of physical interpretation of what this fixed scale might also correspond to, right? So in the biology, I mean, neurons can send out connections up to certain distances only, which corresponds to the arborization distance. And this, this scale D is basically thinking is just corresponding to like the arborization distance of the neurons, like how far can they really send out their connections, right? And so there really potentially are some very direct connections to the connectomics and People have been thinking of looking at connectomic studies in the medial and trinal cortex. So I guess we're, we're really looking forward to what uh, comes out of those uh, results. And I should also say, I mean, this mean period ratio of 1.4 that people talk about in literature, it all just naturally emerges from this setup without having to worry even about what phi is. If you just take the average of this uh, ratio for the first few grid modules, you get a number that's always between 1.3 and 1.45, irrespective of the value of phi. So it's always going to be in this ballpark of 1.4 that people talk about in the literature, but we're being able to say something much more than that. We're actually giving detailed period ratio predictions of what the period ratios are going to be for consecutive grid period models, right? And so that's really quite uh, quite something. Um, I should also point out that, um, as I had mentioned earlier, you can again couple the pattern formation on the neural sheet to spatial tuning curves. I mean, so far I've talked a lot about just how you get modular pattern formation on the neural sheet, but you can use similar arguments that I won't really spend too much time getting into, but you can couple it to get spatial tuning curves as well. So we are in this plot on the x-axis, I basically have spatial position. On the y-axis, I basically have time flowing downwards. And I'm basically considering a rat with velocity in uh, the rightward direction. And so you can see that all of the activity bumps on the neural sheet all also flow towards the right. And I, what I just want to point out quite crucially is that the module boundaries remain roughly fixed, right? So you just have a small uh, boundary region, but that remains fixed and that does not flow with the pattern, which is quite important because if I'm measuring, say, this grid cell over here, I don't want it to have one period at some point. And then later, if I kept going in one direction, it just jumps to the next period, right? That really would be quite, uh, you know, that's, that's nothing like the biology of the system. So it is important that the module boundaries remain fixed. And we are quite happy to see that this entire model does keep those model boundaries fixed. And so that way you can couple things to external space and you can get these spatially periodic tuning curves as I've shown over here, right? So the animal can faithfully keep track of its location uh, in external space through these kinds of grid cells. Um, okay, I've also done all of this so far in one dimension, but uh, that was just for simplicity. You can really very straightforwardly extend all of this to two dimensions. Uh, the same kind of argument goes through. You have the same kind of equations that pop up. It's once again, the very same uh, equation for period ratios, um, but you just have to look at two dimensional Fourier transforms instead or just Hankel transforms if you account for radial symmetry. And really, once again, you can see on a two dimensional uh, particle sheet, two dimensional neural sheet now, spontaneously, even though the system only has continuous gradients, you can see a nice sharp module boundary with different grid periods on different sites. I mean, the lower plots are just autocorrelations showing you how regular this pattern formation really is, right? Now, I, I mentioned very briefly in my title about this all being topologically robust, right? So what do I really mean by that? Um, I, I don't want to get into too many details about this, but what, but what we broadly mean by that is basically the following. That first of all, small perturbations are not going to affect the form module just because you're going to always be in this very flat region, it just corresponds to which local maxima of the fixed scale interaction are you choosing, 
larger perturbations do result in a change, but that change must occur in a discrete fashion. And moreover, every module corresponds to an integer, which is just peak number in Fourier space. And so we think that this peak number in Fourier space is basically like the equivalent of a topologically quantized quantity. Uh, you can have all sorts of small variations that don't really affect um, the emergent behavior. You don't really affect this this point, this uh, topological number, and you have very very robust uh, pattern formation and grid cell modules. Um, okay, that's probably just throwing a bunch of fancy physics terms. But what does that mean for like a neuroscientist or a neuro neurobiologist? What does topologically robust mean? Well, it just means that the system is very, very robust. So, so far I looked at these nice cute cases where I had these very spatially invariant kernels, which are all very neat. But over here now I have a two dimensional cortical sheet, two dimensional neural sheet, where these black blotches are these really random looking um, interaction kernels, which are doing the pattern formation process. And well, they're really noisy. And you can see that if you run pattern formation with this kind of a kernel, which is just so heterogeneous, you just don't get any pattern formation at all. So this plot is of the autocorrelation, and you can see there's really no periodic structure in this. But if you just add a fixed scale interaction, that just cleans it entirely up, and you get this very, very clear uh, hexagonal pattern formation, even if the pattern forming kernel was just as noisy as before. You know, So just this addition of this fixed scale just adds so much robustness to the system that it gives you very clean pattern formation. So the robustness is not only in the shapes of the kernels, you can have Mexican hats and boxes and so on and so forth. It's not only in heterogeneities in the system, but it's also robust to activity perturbations. So I can just lesion off a certain region of my cortical sheet. I can just turn off neurons in a certain region and that the other grid, grid periods remain completely unaffected, right? And that really is because all of our interactions, all of our kernels are just local with respect to the scale of these formed modules. And this is quite interesting as well, because this is again something you can go in the biology, you can actually do an experiment and test this. And it seems like it would be quite important for this to be the case for a biological system. But this itself is something that um, some other models that try to think of grid cell modularization fail to do, right? So it's quite an important property that you would expect of a biological system, and it goes through very well with our model. So there's really a lot, lots of forms of robustness. And I just want to say, have one side on just talking about why we think this mechanism is quite general, right? So the minimal setups required for peak selection are really quite few. You just need a loss function that has multiple maxima and minima. You need some sort of a gradient that is related to something that smoothly varies. And that smoothly varying function is just going to select a peak, right? And that's why you call it peak selection. So in this very general setup of you know, gradients, gradients tied to some sort of regularization and a, you know, a, a, a loss function that has multiple maxima or minima, minima which is really there in lots of problems, that's really sufficient to get modularization. So we do think that this mechanism is fairly general and we're really actively looking for examples of other systems where this might apply. Uh, with that, I'd just like to throw up some conclusions. I mean, we're basically showing a model that almost perfectly matches the experimental data. It's such close fit to data that we do think that future connectomic studies may reveal this form of a connectivity with like a fixed scale interaction. Uh, it's really just a single parameter. There's no fine tuning. I'm not optimizing over any large data set. Um, and there's this really strong form of robustness. And it's overall a very general mechanism. I just like to put up the paper again, where we just uh, discuss all of these results. And uh, thank you for your time. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Sartak. So uh, yeah, I guess we are open for questions now. Anybody? Uh, just unmute yourself as you by now know, I guess. Um, yeah, hi, uh, this is Rutupanna. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just had a very simple question that, that the, uh, does the size of the grid modules matter or do they have significance in terms of for say, related to spatial coding or something like that? Um, okay, uh, so when you say size, I mean, I guess you could mean one of two possible things. Do you mean the size of the neural sheet or the grid period? Uh, size of a neural sheet. I see. So the size of the neural sheet, I don't think is as relevant um, as long as you have a sufficiently large region and you have a sufficiently large number of grid cells to be able to, you know, uh, map out all possible phases. Uh, the grid periods in themselves uh, you want them to be um, basically distinct 
um, you want them to not be, uh, I mean, basically you want to be able to do something like, uh, I mean, so basically what you're doing is through each grid module, you're keeping track of a remainder with respect to a different lattice. So you want these lattices to cover enough scale so that you can back, narrow back down what your spatial position was. So the requirements for spatial coding are essentially that you want there to be enough number of grid modules and you just need enough number of grid cells per module to just be able to keep track of, you know, to sufficiently encode your spatial position. And so by that, you mean the, like, the grid pattern should be intact or should be intact? Yes, the grid patterns, the, the, the periodicity of the patterns should cover, huh. it should be enough number of periods to be able to fully encode the position. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, yeah, you were talking of robustness, Sarthak. So, yes. uh, the Mexican hat is a fairly, shall I say, um, localized potential. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you took something which is pretty, if you took a kernel which is fairly broad, like a Lorenzian safe, does it remain robust? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So, a Lorenzian is, is very interesting that you choose Lorenzian. So it turns out that uh, for pattern formation to go through, um, almost every function yeah. works. There's a small set of functions that don't yeah. work. And a Lorenzian is one of those functions that don't work. Uh, but let's just assume that you had a different function that had a long tail. I guess that's the essence of your question. Um, in general, yeah. that would not matter for uh, the theory of this entire process. Right. As long as you, when you have its Fourier transform, the Fourier transform basically has uh, something that I guess uh, maybe this is the best slide for that. As long as you have a Fourier transform that also has like a maxima, uh, it's fine. I mean, even okay. if this were much broader, as long as it varied continuously, this peak selecting function would vary continuously. And as long as you have this oscillatory functions over here, you will get peak selection. There must be some kind of mathematical condition on uh, what kind of kernels work, but that will be, I think, fairly, that will be a fairly large class of kernels, what you could use. Yeah, I mean, so, I would guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so we haven't been able to prove it strictly, uh, but we have a lot of heuristics that suggest that almost every kernel works. Like if you have a kernel that doesn't work, okay. you can apply a small random perturbation and it will work. Uh, but that's not something we have to strictly prove theoretically, but we have to give some heuristics for that result. You've heard of the self-organizing maps, right? You must have, I mean, they're, uh -huh. they're so, yeah. so, okay. Yeah. So any idea like that would work for this, you know, covenants map just to take a random guess. That of course is sigmoidal. So I see. Okay. So um, that, that's a, that's a great question, right? So um that is something that we are actually very actively thinking about uh, because we've been thinking of self organized maps um giving rise to modularity in a different part of the brain and we do think that there are potentially some connections to be made with peak selection but we haven't quite been able to draw them out entirely um so i mean we do think that this mechanism is quite general it requires very little to be set up and go through and in a lot of settings where you try to write on these self-organizing maps, it seems like you might have enough for peak selection to go through, but we haven't quite been able to make those analogies precise. Also, that's a great question to which I would love to have an answer, but I don't have one yet. Maybe you could give us a talk in IIT and discuss this. I'm sure many of my colleagues would be interested. That uh, Oh, yeah. I'd be more than happy to. Yeah, I'd be more than yeah. happy to. So we'll organize it sometime. And uh, any other questions? Uh, are, are, are there any other questions from other participants? Amit? I don't, I don't see anybody else who uh, has okay. raised a hand or anything. So, so I, I guess uh, yeah, so. the next talk is in the afternoon, right? I mean, the last one, basically. Yeah, with the stock. It's, it's uh, the last. It's two, the last, and then we. And then go, the yeah, closing sessions. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that's at two o'clock, right? Or yes. Two thirty. Yeah. Uh, let me just check. Uh, 
sorry, I, I, my schedule is somewhere. It's two o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. So two to two forty, and then the closing remote. So. Yeah. Okay. You may or may not wake up, Sarthak. Let's. <laughs> I yeah, likely yeah. will not be up until then. I can yeah. imagine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have been, you have been doing quite a few things at quite odd hours for me, <laughs> for, for my schedule. But anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I, Thanks a I, lot I, for uh, for yeah. So. I I just had a great time. I mean, I've had a great yeah. time at this okay. meeting. I think it's great. been very relevant to like the intersection of a lot of my interests from my PhD days yeah. up to my postdoc. Yeah, but just yeah, you know, yeah. I've just had a great time. I've just had yeah. a wonderful time. Yeah, Ho hopefully we can hold the uh, extended event like this in person at ICTs. That would be nice. So, yeah, that would yeah. be wonderful. Yeah. 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 So we may not see you in the evening. So thank you so much. And like Amit said, we hope to have a follow up. Plus, yeah. I hope I hope you'll be able to speak in IIT. I'll be in touch about that. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That, right. that'd be great. Yeah. And uh, thanks for inviting me. It's just yeah. been it's just been wonderful. Okay. Great. Yeah. 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 Bye. So I guess see okay. you so we'll most at least most of you now. in the afternoon. Bye. Yeah. Okay. Bye then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.